Hey, Pastor Steve Waldron. I was up teaching uh, Christian Evidences at Indiana Bible College recently, and so it's kind of a shortened class. I teach like two classes back to back on Monday night, two classes Tuesday night, and then I do that twice. I go up there twice during a semester to do that, and then they have to read a book and write some papers and you know get their notes graded and all this kind of stuff. So it's a it's a condensed two hour class, and. Uh, um, so I was really just like, okay, what do I teach on that last night? And the argument from the obviousness, and this is a major proof for the existence of God, the argument from the obvious. And let me just uh, share some of it with you. It says, since matter and energy are neither increasing or decreasing, something beyond matter and energy must have created them. So matter and energy, you know, they might be changing forms, but they're neither uh, decreasing or increasing. This would be like what? The the second law, first law of thermodynamics. Um, so if they're not, if they're stable, and this is all we can observe is this stability, then something outside of them must have created them. Okay, and probably something spiritual since this is material, and so we know material laws. Now you might say, well, that's crazy, I'm going to dispute the existence of God, but wait a second. The current uh, evolutionary theory would say that there was a dot or a pair full of the universe hanging nobody knows where because space and time is inside the pair. And then it explodes through mechanisms we don't know about. It's all speculation, trying to fit the observable facts into something material instead of something supernatural, because the basic premise of modern science would be that in a personal level, you can believe in the supernatural, but not in a scientific level. Science means materialism. So they're like, that's the only material theory that we can currently come up with, Fred Hoyle, uh, with Graham saying, Chandra Graham saying, came up with steady state theory, matter is eternal. But then you start getting it, when you say eternal, you may start getting into supernatural again, the spiritual. Okay, so since matter and energy are neither increasing or decreasing, something beyond matter and energy must have created them. Since neither matter or energy creates, so neither matter or energy creates, something other than matter uh, must have created it, such as spirit. Um, this is, and this is just the argument from obviousness. And here's some more. That's more one of the more complex ones. Let's go to some of the easier ones. Um, organization requires an organizer. And this would go back to Paley's watchmaker, which I don't think has ever been adequately refuted. I've got here to do like on cells. Um, that cells. Every cell has walking parts inside to put like a ADP and ADP taking it to the proper places obviously organized and so everything we see that's organized the computer the phone the Bible this table everything that's organized had to have an organizer okay concepts of moral just good truth beauty are something beyond materialism Okay, so if you're just a jumbled mass of organized cells that came from a bacteria, bacteria to man, monkeys to man, instead of from God to man, the descent of man, as Charles Darwin said it, then what is more? Moral is that which keeps me alive, that which is best for the community. Uh, who defines these things? Justice. Who defines justice? Is the hierarchies we see in the animal realm, are they just uh, goodness, truth, beauty? The fact that we admire sunsets, sunrise, the smell of flowers, the beauty of flowers, uh, other things, the animals. These concepts would are something that require something beyond ourselves something spiritual, something from a mind that we're in the image of God that has these concepts of justice. God's throne is the throne of justice. These are just obvious things. Since the concept of deity is universal, it must point to something or someone. And I know people will try to say they found atheistic tribes, but when they dig down and unpack everything, they believe in God.
So some would say this is the evolutionary part of the brain, that evolution required, you know, Freud's totem and taboo and Moses and monotheism, that we would look at our fathers and to maintain some sense of morality. But again, you have very difficult times defining morality and ethics and justice and right and wrong outside of a biblical framework. And something with eternal ramifications fits best, such as Scripture and the Word of God. So the concept of deity is universal. It must point to something or someone. Uh, since procreation, and Romans 1 says that's obvious. Uh, since procreation requires multiples with specific characteristics, they must have been sp spontaneous designed for that purpose. Okay, so for procreation, you know, humans at some point got to where a man had certain uh, necessities for procreation. A woman had, you know, a receptacle and a womb and hips for certain things. So leading up to that point, it, it, nothing would work and there would be no procreation and so humans wouldn't exist, okay? So they had to, it had to be something that was spontaneous and fully formed and fully filled, not just for humans, but for all animals. And so this is something, if you think about it, and that's a basic problem is people don't think. They let others do thinking for them, or they have the argument of authority think for them. But if you just think that process through, it's impossible. And that's the reason, like even Stephen Jay Gold, who kind of recapitulated the uh, spontaneous generation period, the punctuated equilibriums, he's like every 50,000 years, males and females of each species just spontaneously appear. But then you have all of the necessities such as water, air, proper atmosphere, uh, plant life, food, that also has to be available for these beings to survive. All right, so this is just obvious. Beauty or nature serves no material purpose uh, oftentimes. Beauty for beauty's sake. So people paint a picture. They make a sculpture. They uh, do these things. It's beauties for beauty's sake. They build a building just for beauty's sake. Um, nature has beauty instilled in it for no purpose. You know, I think it's funny that uh, people, scientists spend all this time, instead of finding a cure for cancer or something, what is the purpose of the beauty of the peacock's feathers? Well, it was to scare things off. Well, then they do the test and it doesn't scare things off, you know. So it must have scared something off that's no longer in existence. It was a major predator. So then you're getting into the realms of faith because you're saying, I don't know, I'm just going to have faith. Well, then why don't you just have faith in the obvious, that organization requires an organizer, and the things that we see are so fine-tunedly organized, they had to have a fine-tuned organizer. Okay, so uh, abiogenesis, or spontaneous generation, does not occur in nature. Life comes from life. This is the laws of biogenesis. You remember Pasteur, Louis Pasteur with Pasteur's beaker. It was assumed before that time, you know, that maggots came out of uh, rotting meat or rotting flesh. It was just something that was an assumption, but it wasn't true. So, you know, he put in uh, a beaker some meat. And then it had a system of entrances where air could get in to rot the meat so it's not sealed. But at the same time, it would keep out, you know, the maggots and the flies and all this. And you saw that maggots don't spontaneously erupt. And so spontaneous generation doesn't occur. Where did the primeval pair come from? The primeval atom? Where uh, would these things come from? They don't just spontaneously occur. Life comes from life. It doesn't come from electricity. And so like the Miller-Urey experiments in the 1950s where they created amino acid, um, there's still a long way between that and, and the system of proteins and amino acids having, they're contrary to each other, but they have to be in perfect harmony with each other for there to be life. Scientists everywhere have not created life from non-life. But even if they did, what would that say? That 
intelligence did that. It didn't arise spontaneous in nature. Okay. So similarities between creatures don't indicate common descent, but rather common design or ubiquitous design or the best design. Like uh, uh, the two nostrils on a gorilla and me as a human being, two eyes on a gorilla, two eyes. This two eye concept is something that God thought was the best way and it is the best way and mankind's created the image of God when he would become a man in Christ Jesus and so similarity of design doesn't necessitate a similarity of ancestor it necessitates it can necessitate a uh, uniqueness of design that is the best way it doesn't have to be a uniqueness of the ancestor and so like when you do the chimp 98 percent dna is the same as ours this, these are things that are not true all right um which i'll do videos on showing you scientifically while well, that's not true i'm not just gonna make that statement lord willing hallelujah so omni creatures are not evidence of transition, but rather evidences of specific design. Like the platypus, people would say, well, this is a classic look at a, a creature that doesn't fit into our man-made categories. But, and so they would say it must be in some state of evolution, but not necessarily, because everything about like the duckbill platypus is perfect for its current environment. So omni creatures, even like Archaeotyrex, doesn't necessarily mean it's a missing link. Because everything we see today is fully formed and fully filled. Nothing is evolving. You don't see partiality. Everything is functioning perfectly. All right, the chain of life. Um, humans, airs, water, plants for breath. You know, so it takes something for survival. It takes water, it takes air, it takes an atmosphere. Plants take, breathe differently than humans. Humans breathe differently than plants. But we're codependent on each other. And then we're all codependent on water and food and soil and nutrients. Even the nutrients in the soil and the roots. This is just obvious. So the chain of life is just this obvious principle. Um, the interdependence of complex systems within the body that your let's say your gastrointestinal system has to be fully formed to function but it's not just fully formed to function it's got to be connected with your esophageal system the chain of life out here your acids your teeth your tongue uh, you get in your esophageal system with you, you know, one side goes into your lungs, one side goes into your stomach. All these things have to, and many more, and then the acids breaking it up to get it into the bloodstream. All this thing has to work perfectly, as well as our motor skills, our eyes, our brains, our neurons. It has to be working perfectly for any of these things to function. So the interdependence of complex systems um, is. Uh, totally debunks any type of uh, evolution. It just couldn't happen. This is, a, this is the obvious principle. This is the principle of obviousness in the existence of God. Centropy, like the eye, for example, that uh, this, you know, Darwin said it's uh, absurd to think of the eye. He thought these things through, unlike many modern philosophers and evolutionists, that the eye could evolve. It could not evolve. Because a partial eye is just a glob. All of the rods, everything, the pupil, everything about the complexity of the eye has to be going at the same time. Or it's not going to work. It's just not. And then, you know, it becomes from a duopoly to a cyclops to the brain to all this. And so all closed systems, centropic systems within us, our skeletal system, could you imagine a partial tibia, partial fibia, partial femur? These are, it has to be totally at one time. And then all the joints and the bones and the marrows. And all these things are just obvious. But Satan blinds. That's the purpose of Satan. 
And so God gives life and light. Okay, the dependence of life on other life requires spontaneity and not gradualism. Like sheep depend on men. Um, certain bacteria or certain parasites depend on other things. And the most obvious example, you know, bees depend on flowers. Flowers depend on bees. Pollination. They had to be spontaneous. We depend on plants. Plants depend on us for breathing. And I saw one of the coolest things the other day, and it's an overhead view of a forest. And the forest during the course of the day moves the entire forest, the leaves. I guess because of the sun's position. Without, I'm not talking about with no wind, it moves. And I thought, man, that is so utterly cool that God's got like the whole world worshiping him if you interpret it through that theistic thing. Okay. Um, the impossibility of the evolutionary chain that the evolutionary chain just could not exist because again partial systems don't work. So uh, and many people have tried to go through how do we get from whales to this? How do we go from from amphibians to mammals? How do we how do we get to this? And once you start breaking down all the various features, and not just doing a superficial view, but like you know throats and, and all of this, you find it's a total in, impossibility. So the the evolutionary chain is impossible. Also, the miraculous characteristics of water, which deserves its own video of itself, such as water freezing from the top down, even though it's colder at the bottom, um, is absolutely amazing. And so that would require a designer. And uh, there are no transitional fossils. So not only do we not observe transitions happening, Everything is fully functioning, fully formed, fully replicating right now. None of this is in the fossil record. Darwin rightly speculated. He said the whole fossil record should be intermediaries. So what you have, and, and it's funny to me, like somebody watched one of my videos and Google said, I Googled it and there's one million Google searches for transitional fossils. Wow. That means absolutely nothing because it could be a million things refuting transitional fossils. Or it could be all talking about the same disputed transitional fossils. So study it for 30 years and, you know, and then come. That's, I'm like, really? Have we devolved to this? Which I use Google. But, and devolve, that's a play on words there. Okay. And that is what we're seeing is mankind is devolving, not evolving. All right. So the fossil record has no transitional fossils and very few even disputed fossils. And definitely not chains, not links. Okay, the smallest organisms are irreducibly complex and have no evolution to come from. The smallest things you see have motors, have engines. And this is scientific, you know, word saying this, have stomachs. And so there's nothing smaller they could have evolved from. And so this is Michael Behe's uh, Darwin's Black Box has only uh, grown stronger in its refutation of uh, Darwinian evolution. Okay, everyone has felt something higher to themselves. Atheists become militant because they feel something. I mean, you look at Jean-Paul Sartre with existentialism. You know, he talks about, he was Trinitarian, he's French. And so he talks about trying to get rid of the father and the son. And then he talks about he's down in his basement in the coal room trying to get rid of the Holy Ghost. Well, what he's saying, I mean, he feels something. Um, you know, I don't believe in Santa Claus, but I'm not militantly trying to eradicate Santa Claus from every place. And so if God doesn't exist, why are people so militant, some of them, in trying to uh, attack? I do find it fascinating that some of the responses on the YouTube channel have been from atheists that say we want to keep Christian traditions because we think it provides for a stable moral society. I think that's good. And yes, Christianity has been used for bad in the past, but not true Christianity. True Christianity is uh, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. 
Okay, so everyone has felt something higher than themselves. That's Paul in Romans 1. The universality of morality. Like in every society, people know killing is wrong, lying is wrong, stealing is wrong. There has to be some universal absolute for this. Um, universal purpose and meaning. People want to accomplish something. It's not just evolutionary for themselves. Like what would be the purpose of fame? Um, because if all you've got is this time period between birth and death, you would just want what's the most you could get in that time period. There would be no purpose for fame. So people want to have purpose for life. What would be the purpose of raising children if all they are is bacterial accidents and we're just a small blue dot in the cosmic universe? So universal of purposeness and meaning. Time requires something eternal. We have time, so something outside of time had to create time. Something beyond time had to create time. How would time spontaneously erupt? All right. Um, the cosmological argument, the first cause. Uh, cars, watches, nothing. As Parmenides says, nothing comes from nothing. You can think of that two ways. Nothing comes from nothing. That's true. And nothing comes from nothing. So nothing comes from nothing. Um, so Parmenides rightly saw this. The concept of truth. There must be a standard for reality. Lamarckianism does not happen. DNA is a closed system. External factors do not change DNA. Mendelian genetics show this. Um, you can cut off as many generations of rat tails as you want, but because the DNA says that rat's supposed to have a tail, it's always going to have a tail. So the giraffe's neck didn't extend by trying to get food on top. And if it did, it was only one, like the males, because the females have smaller necks, you know. So that's been rightly ported out, or maybe it's vice versa. But anyhow, that just doesn't happen. Jews still get circumcised, you know, 3,500 years, because the DNA says that foreskin's supposed to be there. It's a closed system. So an amputee won't give birth to an amputee, because the DNA says there's supposed to be a full leg there. So, uh, and then the anthropological argument that all, everything we are, where we're at in the, un, at the Milky Way, the arm we're at, the, the universality of water, our peering system into the universe, the perfectness of uh, where we're at for our moon and for our sun and the distance of other planets from us, show us that we were created with a purpose in mind, the anthropological principle. And that's a whole nother video. I've probably done a video on it by itself. So this is the major proof for the existence of God, the argument from obviousness. And uh, I think if you'll follow it, think it through, you'll know what I'm telling you is true. God bless. Talk with you later in Jesus' name.